Welcome to the Just Bernard Show here on Facebook Live as well as multiple social media platforms. I've got a wonderful show for you guys today. I've been talking about it for the last several weeks and I'm really happy that Dave's here. We are going to be speaking with David Ditchfield about near-death experience uh, in just a few moments. Uh, but let me just uh, give you guys just a moment to log on and um, get into the chat. If you have any questions for us, by all means, you're welcome to put them uh, in the chat. I hope everyone is having a fairly nice week. It's been a little bit chaotic. I'm sure uh, many of us are staying grounded. Uh, it's been a wonderful um, experience for me in the sense that I'm getting a lot of things done. Uh, with that being said, Interestingly enough, uh, those of you might have been expecting me to be on the Kingdom of Nye radio program, I believe it was last Wednesday, and uh, they had some technical difficulties. Apparently, uh, Heather's amplifier uh, blew up or something. They had to replace the amplifier. Needless to say, uh, they've invited me back on, and I've agreed to come back on uh, April 16th. So I will keep posting about that and keep you updated with that. I'm really excited to go on with her. I haven't been on with um, Heather since she was hosting uh, Midnight in the Desert right after Art uh, Bell gave it to her. So it would be nice to talk to her and spend the whole evening, four hours. That's a long show, but I I'm up for it if you are. <laughs> anyway, as well, I did just, <clears throat> I did just uh, recently announce that uh, I was teaching a uh, workshop here in Roanoke. Uh, we were going to be doing a master class on the Tarot, and uh, due to the coronavirus, uh, I've gone ahead and uh, scheduled that to be online. Uh, for those of you uh, that have been keeping up with that, I did say we were going to do an online version of that uh, in the summer. Well, I'm moving that up a little bit closer. So if you are interested, you can actually, if you go to my Facebook page, which you should be on now anyway, you scroll up to the top, there is a post there, uh, and there is a coupon code for you to get $10 off uh, the seminar. It's going to be a four-hour seminar, so uh, we'll get to spend the afternoon together on April 11th, and I look forward to that. Live from the heart of the Blue Ridge, Roanoke, Virginia, it's the Just Bernard Show with host Bernard Alvarez. Join Bernard as he shares topics that reveal the real matrix and empower your human experience, including world liberty, the esoteric, suppressed technologies, spiritual ascension, and human consciousness. Humanity has awakened, and our time has come to realize our full potential. And now, live from the Star City, your host, Bernard Alvarez. Anyway, so without further ado, I'm excited to speak to this gentleman today, especially about a very interesting experience, which I myself have experienced, and I'm sure uh, some of you that are watching today have gone through, or may have gone through, or know someone who have gone through a uh, near-death experience. Uh, David Ditchfield did have a very near-death experience in 2006 when he was dragged under a speeding train. Uh, he had uh, some major epiphanies during that time and came back with tons of information uh, to share with all of that, S share with all of us. He has a new book, uh, Shine on the Story, which will be out on June 26, 2020. And uh, David Ditchfield is here to share with us uh, on that, as well as some of the information he brought back. So welcome to the show today, David. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me along. It's great to be here. Well, I'm very happy to have you here as well. So David, let's jump right in. Um, so I, let me start off with asking you, before you had the near-death experience, did you believe in the afterlife what was life like for you uh, prior to that and was it a lot different than what you expected when you returned yeah it was a, a complete contrast i'd say my life before um I, the afterlife didn't really come into my sort of train of thought as it were um you know i was just kind of living uh, by the day as it were um 
not really touching the surface, I'd say, in my life. Um, I was struggling to get by, actually. I was on a downward spiral, uh, just right up to the point of my near-death experience. Because, um, just to cut it short, I'd left school without any qualifications. And so, for me, I'd, I'd moved down to London, and it was a struggle to sort of, you know, keep above water. And I was picking up work, doing mainly man manual labouring work, um, you know, blue-collar work, which is... Uh, which is great, it played the bills, but it wasn't really, I didn't really think about anything, that, anything spiritual at all at that point. And um, yeah, I, um, I, I, I went onto a downward spiral. And so my sister contacted me and said, look, why don't you come and spend a few days with us? She was living in Cambridgeshire, her and her family. And she said, you need a break. You need to get away from London. So I did. So I, I went and stayed there for a few days. And um, I was like hanging out and uh, I just met somebody actually um, a couple of weeks before going up there who I just kind of got this connection with. I really liked her and we, we just kind of like knew each other really well and we kept in touch on the phone and she said, oh, why don't I come and hang out with you? I said, yeah, brilliant. So she came up for a few days and stayed in Cambridgeshire and uh, then I, I saw her off at the, at the rail station. She had to get back to London and... Um, yeah, and that's where things were suddenly life changing for me, I'd say, at that point, because I was seeing her off at, at the rail station and uh, I helped her with a bag onto the train. And um, I was just saying goodbye to her, and then and I heard the emergency buzzers go on, on the door of the carriage saying, you know, they're about to close. But I was still sort of like saying, look, you take care. And, you know, and I was like giving her a hug and, 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 and kiss them to say goodbye and as the emergency the, not the emergency the, the automatic doors closed they kind of clamped straight onto the bottom edge of my coat and I was wearing like a sort of like a, a sheepskin coat that day because it was very cold it was a cold day in February and it was quite a thick quality one and I just couldn't pull it out I just couldn't release it you know and I thought oh, this isn't good you know and I knew there was no way it was going to come out of the doors so i looked around the platform at that point to see if there was anyone around like a guard on the station platform there was no one there was nothing there was just one of the guy actually who was seeing off his girlfriend at the time um and so i figured i was you know this is i shouted actually i shouted out for help that was my first course of action so i was just shouted help 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 you know but uh, nobody turned up then i started like hitting the, the, there was two buttons either side of the door, so, you know, open and close. I was just kind of whacking those very hard with my fists, but nothing, nothing at all. The doors remained closed. And um, I, I sort of, I, the engine started to, to rev up, you know, and that was pretty frightening because I thought this train's about to pull out now and, uh, and I'm stuck. Uh, so I just figured at this point, this is it, you know, I'm actually going to die. And, and it was, happened so fast that for going from, you know, being happily saying goodbye uh, to my new friend, uh, that it was like, this is it. The moment of, of death. I was, I was staring death in the face, if you like, because as the train started to pull out, um, I felt it was like I was, I got, I lost my footing eventually because of the, you know, there was, it pulled out at such speed. You don't realize how fast these trains pull out of the stations until you're actually on the outside, actually attached to it. And uh, the adrenaline rush at, at that point was, was really quite high because it was just like, I was dragged so fast that I, was, I lost my footing. And I kind of figured I'd still got one last chance that maybe, you know, the coat might actually just pull itself out from the sheer force of my body being dragged along. But that wasn't the case. And, um, um, then I was pulled through this, the gap between the actual platform and the train itself. And then I was just dragged into this sheer darkness. So it was just like this huge drop. And I remember just at that point looking up and just seeing like the side of the carriage doors almost disappearing into the sky, it looked like to me. I'll, I'll never forget that point. And then I thought, I'm not going to survive now. I'm, I'm going to die. Um, and I was, then I heard this enormous rip and then I was just suddenly thrown 
around uh, like a, like a rag doll. I was just tossed backwards and forwards as the train by then was going at tremendous speed, and uh, and it was like I was conscious throughout the whole of this episode. So it was like very harrowing <laughs> because you know it was this. I just didn't know what was going to happen next at that point, and then suddenly I was lying in between the track and the train was still going above my head and i still figured at this point it's not over yet you know uh, a bit of the undercarriage could just come along and whack me uh, over the back of my head you know so i just kept my head right down into the gravel as it were in between the tracks and uh, then uh, eventually the train moved on and the sort of ferocious sound of all these you know, all these wheels grinding and everything and the sound of the actual train itself suddenly disappeared into the distance and then there was light and uh and the, then there was a lack of horrific sound and i just lay there and i couldn't believe that i was still alive and um yeah so, uh, <laughs> oh my God. so yeah um the paramedics arrived really quick as well because uh, there was a hospital just around the corner so they were like sort of alerted uh, very fast and so they kind of came and jumped down you know, it's quite a it's quite a huge leap from the actual platform down to the actual you know ground where i was lying but they managed to get down and get me on the stretcher yeah. was it difficult for them to, to uh, lift you up out of the uh the track area yeah yeah i mean it was it was quite a lengthy process you know they were kind of like they had to cut my clothes off me and stuff and uh and uh, it's really funny that the, the things that happened you know like, i remember lying there i just bought these new armani jeans and i got them on that day when i was seeing my friend off and uh they were saying i'm afraid we're gonna have to cut through your trousers sir and i said no 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 my, my legs are fine They're not the jeans please save <laughs> this is crazy of course because right right day, looking back you know they're trying to save my life and uh so because i was losing a lot of blood at that point i was c cut up pretty bad and uh so uh, but yeah i don't know how they do it but they managed to sort of get me onto a stretcher um you know i was in an awful lot of pain so i couldn't bear to be moved you know just from left or right or whatever you know but they, they managed to get me on a stretcher and up onto the platform and uh once they got me in the back of an ambulance, um, you know, the doctor who was like, who was the head of the paramedic team said, look, um, there is a hospital around the corner, but I think the one that's going to save you is a good driveway. Can you, can you hang on? I said, yeah, let's do it. So off we went and, you know, the, the lights were on, you know, the, the sirens and we just screamed all the way down the, down the highway, you know, to, to this hospital. And when we arrived, there's, I just remember just seeing this whole team of medics and they were all waiting for me. And there was like this bay that was all open and waiting. And then they just rushed me in and there was a lot of chaos doctors running around, you know, and uh, they kept saying he's losing lots of blood. He's losing a lot of blood. So um, I, I was still, you know, not sure whether I was going to actually survive right. at that point. Yeah. I would think adrenaline was keeping you conscious, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I guess that's a good point, actually. I guess the adrenaline was doing that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so it was at that point when I was laid in the emergency department with all this frantic uh, noise going on around me that I suddenly went from all this agony and all the bright lights sort of glaring into my eyes to. Um, to this really wonderful warm place and um uh, and i didn't know where i was at first but all i knew was was that it was a, a heck of a lot better than where i'd just been and uh and i just suddenly felt really really calmed and um and the pain had, had dispersed and i was just looked around me and the first things that i saw were these kind of pulsatings of orbs if you like of light and um, it was just pulsating all around me all different colors kind of, of ambers and greens and reds and uh, yellows and so that was really comforting and i just thought oh, this, is, this is beautiful and i looked and i was no longer laid on the stretcher i was like on this huge kind of like uh, like a slate rock almost like a like a 
a medieval altar, if you like. You know, it was just a huge piece of rock. And but I felt really comfortable on it. It didn't matter that I was laid out on this. And um, I looked to the right of me, just at the end of my feet, and suddenly there was, uh, I wasn't alone. I realized that there was like this being of light that was stood there, this person, like an androgynous person mm -hmm. um, with this pure white sort of blonde hair. Um, but wearing like a, just like a, like a contemporary black, um, you know, t-shirt, you know, and um, just, just staring at me. But I felt this kind of like this wonderful feeling of like warmth and um, um, reassurance coming off this being. And, and I also felt like I'd known uh, the being. It was, it was neither male or female, uh, but I, I, and I felt that I'd known this, this androgynous being for all my life and beyond you know it's hard to explain but it was there was a really strong bond there and um we nothing was said between us other than that i knew that that person was there to care for me so i just lay my head back at this point and i looked up and then there were three grids of white light were suddenly appearing uh, just uh, over my head and i just couldn't take my gaze away from this white light because it just felt like it was like a healing light, basically, um, like I'd never seen before in my life. And it was so bright that normally, you know, I'd, I would, I'd, I'd be turning my head away. Like you wouldn't be able to look in a, an electric light or the sun, for example. Right. But this I could, and I just wanted to keep looking at it. And I was almost hit, hypnotized by its beauty, you know, and I just felt this healing energies were, were, were coming towards my, my body and, so I lay there for some time and then I, I suddenly felt the presence of two other beings uh, either side of me, two female forms. And um, they, they were kind of like, one of them was almost like a sort of like, sort of Asian Indian or Native American even uh, look about her. And, uh, and the other one was like some more white cohesion, but they had their hands slowly hovering over my body. And I could feel the energy from their hands was really powerful. It was just kind of healing me. But interestingly enough, all my wounds were okay. They were intact. You know, I couldn't see any bleeding, any scarring or, or bruising. Everything looked okay. And I realized that I was just covered. I'd got no clothes other than this beautiful sort of like blue cloth that was covering my body. And it was like a sort of satin sort of, uh, sheet if you like and it was just it just felt really cool and, and relaxing just lying over the top of my body um and so i just figured that what was coming what was radiating from from the being the first being that i'd seen and from these other two that were healing me was this kind of sense of unconditional love that was just being given to me and it was the, it was so powerful the love it was just like all the different types of love you've, you've got experienced in your life, you know, or in my life anyway, you know, either through a lover or, or my mother and father or sister or brother or, or even my pet cat or whatever, you know, it was, it was all these different types of energy of love are all sort of like condensed and coming straight through uh, the hands of these healers. And um, so that was really quite beautiful. And um, I figured at that point that um my family i knew that my family had just arrived just before uh, i'd had as as i'd arrived in the hospital so they were there they were present and i knew that they probably would be stood over my body because they'd been called in and and i figured they were just going to be really stressed out because I, I i thought i was dead i thought this is it this is the afterlife mm -hmm. this is where we go and um i thought well you know they're going to be pretty stressed out so for some reason, I just felt the best way to be able to see. I, I thought I've got to look at them and see how they're doing. So I just kind of leant over the edge of this, this huge uh, piece of slate and, and looked down to my left-hand side, hoping to see them below me. But um, that wasn't the case. I didn't see them at all. But what I did see was this most remarkable sight. It was like this um, a huge waterfall of stars that were just like cascading down in, into... Um, into into other galaxies and, and going beyond into into an abyss basically it was just like into infinity 
it was just huge. It was just like, it was just an enormous sight and, and it was just so enchanting and, and so, um, uh, it was just so powerful as well because um, I, I, again, all the energy that was coming from that waterfall was, was, was just, I was feeling it and sort of coming through every sort of, you know, sort of molecule of my body, if you like. And uh, I, then, of course, I realized at that point that I wasn't actually in a small darkened room that I figured at the beginning, um, that I was actually in the universe itself. And as I looked around, I could just see there were stars all around me. Mm. And um, I just thought, this is, wow, this is remarkable. I, I got no sensation of regret that I had died, uh, that I felt that I died, I should say, that far from it, uh, I, I was more than happy to be there. This was just so beautiful. Right. And, uh, and I'd lost all sense because before, when you asked about it before my accident, you know, my life was filled with, with, with guilt because I was feeling that I was messing up a lot in my life because leaving school without those qualifications meant that I had to cut a lot of corners. And so I just felt, I'm just, I've made a mess of my life, you know, but all those feelings are dispersed. So there's no sense of me beating myself up emotionally. I just felt, yeah, I feel great, you know, for the first time in my life. Um, so, um, Did this linger for quite a while? The yeah, sense yeah. of just floating in the universe. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, I, it did. Well, what happened then was I, I, I turned back over, knowing that I, hadn't, I hadn't seen my family, and I, and, and I turned away from the universe, from the universe itself, and then, and then this beautiful waterfall of stars. And then I, as I turned my head round, and uh, I went to lie back down again, and I, I just saw this energy energy that was coming towards me and and i say i saw it because i saw it but i felt it uh and because I, it was almost like this energy of love i talked of was being turned up big time it was like charged you know and there was this source of white light uh that was coming towards me in a tunnel and uh this tunnel was like surrounded by flames rotating around very slowly uh, very dramatically as well of, of oranges and um reds and yellows um but again these flames even though they they were there they were not at all threatening and, mm -hmm. and, and didn't feel frightening to me they just felt again very powerful but very peaceful so this tunnel was just getting closer and closer to me and uh i was just feeling charged up and i just thought this is the this is uh the source of all creation you know this is god this is this isn't like you know what how i would have thought of god before not that i even thought about god that much before mm. but i always figured god would be you know the guy with the, the, the beard in the sky right. and stuff but this this is not he's not in, for me he's not in a human form you know this was it this was the source of all creation and uh so yeah so i, I remember just looking at that and feeling drawn towards it and then i just kind of laid my head back and i remember almost like laughing and smiling at the same time because i was just so filled with this all these joys and then i just put my head back and and it was at that point that i actually found myself back in my own body back in back in the hospital mm. so yeah so it's um so there i was back crashing back to earth <laughs> oh my god and, and all the pain uh, came rushing straight yeah. back into me and then the lights hospital lights and the noise was just kind of like on overkill it was just too much i couldn't deal with it at first you know but there I was. oh wow and then was there that split second moment of wishing you were still up in the universe when you hit your body again <laughs> well yeah there was that split second but you know what it's it's interesting that the, the, there's never been any regrets that I'm thinking, oh God, why did why did they send me back here? Why didn't they keep me there? Because I knew straight away that there was a reason f for all this happening. I figured there was a reason that the, I, they sent me back. You know, it was, it, I've been asking that question for a long time. Well, I still do, you know, but at the beginning, I was lying there in agony and all I could say to myself was, why did that just happen? That was amazing, you know, and my friend who I've been seeing off at the train station and you know she was she was there uh as I'd come back and I well she came, came over to me and I and I they were just about to take me into the theater to operate on me and uh, I said I just I just need to speak to Anna you know so she came over and I said look you know um 
something something amazing has just happened. I, I've, I've got to tell you about it. Something really special. And she put her hand over my mouth and saying, you know, look, um, not now. They tell me later. You know, just try to calm me down. But I was just so filled with excitement. You know, right. So yeah. Wow. So it. I, I understand that um, over the weeks and months after you you healed, you um, convalesced and whatnot, a lot of changes started to happen in your life and you found gifts that you never knew before. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came about? How long did it take to convalesce and uh, when did these gifts start appearing to you? Yeah, well, um, basically, I mean, pretty much straight after I come around from the first operation, uh, I, th I figured I figured I got to record what had happened to everyone. I was scared I was going to lose it. I've never had them, right. but I, I was scared. You know, I thought this is so um, special and amazing, and I just thought I've got to I've got to, I'm, I'm going to do a painting. I'd never done a painting at all like this in my life, but I thought it's got to be huge. It's got to be a big canvas like a, a Michelangelo. You know, I wanted it to be like a Renaissance painting style. You know, in in height and uh, you know grandeur or whatever. So. Um, yeah, so my sister came in to see me the first night and she, she, I was in this room on my own, you know, and she was chatting very quietly and she said, is there anything that I can get you? And I said, yeah, can you, um, can you get me like a, a you know, a small cat, a, a, you know, a pad to sketch on, you know, and then like a pencil. So she went, okay. She was kind of slightly bewildered by it, but she, she brought it in. So I got the nurses to prop me up in bed and I started sketching very faintly what I'd seen. And when I was well enough to come out of hospital, and when I was, I convalesced her back at her home once they discharged me from the actual ward. And um, I just got my hands on a big canvas, you know. In fact, my aunt bought it for me, and uh, she came over to visit from Canada. So she bought me this big canvas, which was really sweet. And uh, I remember looking at it, and I was, I was actually quite nervous to start it because I thought, I can't mess this up. This, this has got to be important, and it's got to work. So. Um, but once I started painting it, it all started coming together and I was just amazed. It was just like, I started thinking, wow, you know, I can paint. This is all, I was, but what I, I know now is that I was channeling uh, ideas through, right. um, because I've done a lot of painting since I've done, you know, I was, I was very prolific after that, you know, and I knew that I was channeling straight away because I'd sit back and I go, wow, I can't believe I've just done that, you know? And I each day I kind of go up and say thank you, you know, it's just because I knew I was getting these ideas coming through. So uh, yeah, so so it started really with the paintings, uh, and um, basically some friends of my sister's were running like this um, yoga Pilates center, and uh, they said, look, we we've, we've got a spare room, a studio for a week if you want to use it to um, start your painting off. And I said, yeah, that'd be cool. So I went in there and I was there for the first week and uh, they said, you know, carry on. This is going, going great. And I said, don't you need the space? They said, yeah, we'll work around you, you know. So I ended up staying there two years, which is amazing, you know. But, but in that two year space, you know, people were coming into the center and they'd talk about me and people would come up and see my paintings. So a lot of people were like very fascinated by the spiritual aspect of it all. Right. And, uh, and one of them was a, a cellist um, from a, an orchestra in Cambridge. And um, she, she said, these are brilliant paintings. And she said, can we use one for our, uh, the poster for our next concert? I said, God, yeah, that'd be brilliant. So that's what happened. That's how that started, that connection. And um, uh, I was going for spiritual healing at the time. Uh, after, after my recovery, I discovered uh, a small spiritualist church uh, near where I was staying. And, uh, I, I stumbled across it because I was looking for answers off other people as well. Well, not answers. I, I, I was looking for other people to, to talk about it with who, right. who might be like-minded, you know. So I thought these people would. And they were. They were great to talk to about it. And I said, look, we do spiritual healing. You look like you could do with some. So I did. And in those healing sessions, um, I would get clairvoyant messages coming from some of the healers. And, and one after another was saying, you're going to write, they're telling me that you're going to write some music about your experience. I was going, okay. And in my previous life, I'd been like a, a guitarist playing, playing guitar, you know, like basic guitar in, in sort of uh, punk sort of rock and roll mm -hmm. type outfits and stuff. And, uh, and so I figured it would be that, but I couldn't play guitar anymore because my left arm had been severed in the accident. So I couldn't do that. 
So I went back to my uh, home and I just pulled out this old um, uh, synthesizer, like a little cheap old Spanish one that I got in the bottom of the wardrobe or whatever, you know, and I pulled that out, plugged it in. And these chords started coming together. It's a really nice chord progression. And I thought, I like that. That sounds good. You know, I started recording it onto a cassette. That's all I got at that point. And I started building it up and I thought, this is what they're talking about. This is the piece that they want me to write. And I thought this should be performed by an orchestra and not by a rock and roll band. Um, so I remember I met up for coffee with, with the, uh, the cellist from the orchestra. And I was telling her about where I was at, you know, and she said, oh, maybe we could perform it one day, you know, and I thought, ah, I'm going to hold you to that. <laughs> and uh, so I just went home and I just carried on building this piece of music up. And um, my brother, um, he's, he turned around to me and he said, look, I've got this computer package that I can let you have. And he said that you, it will, when you play all the parts in on your keyboard, it can, it can then turn it over into um, um, mu mu uh, notation, sorry, mu notation so for, you know, for score. So I said, brilliant. So that's what I did. So I, I started put, building all the parts up. I started hearing different instruments like horns and stuff like that. So my brother, who was really helpful, he was a lot more, you know, up on this stuff he said well, that's going to be a french horn that you're talking about there so i wrote a french horn and built them all up and then i met for a coffee with the with, with the cellist and 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 the conductor from the orchestra showed them the score we were in this coffee bar and they went yeah this looks really interesting we'll give it a go so they did wow so yeah but um again i was channeling i was being helped i right. knew i was you know it was all coming through because there's no way i could have done that there's n not at all you know yeah. Absolutely. And, and let me ask you as far as, because I'm sure our, our viewers would be very curious to know, uh, speaking of channeling, whether it be the art or um, the music or whatnot, or even just through your experience uh, in the other side, what were some of the, or what was there any one particular major epiphany or aha moment that you got uh, either through channeling or through the experience itself, but that kind of changed your your outlook on, on life itself or the universe and how it all works? That's a big question, but I think you might be able to get what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, yeah, yeah. Well, well, obviously the epiphany happened um, as soon as I came back from the NDE itself, but I, I kept learning as I was going along and, and stuff was still coming through. I realized that I was still actually connected. Part of me was still connected to that other part of the world. You know what I mean, I wasn't completely just me back here on earth. So, um, I realized that um, I, 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 I got a lot to learn through telepathy and through meditation and through spiritual healing and also through mediums as well. You know, a lot of stuff was coming through. But um, I suppose the epiphany was, was to realize that um, the, I, was, I, was, I was not giving myself any, any self-love before, you know. I didn't know how to do that and I hadn't even thought about it. I was just trying to skim the surface of, surface of life. Whereas now, um, you know, I realize that self-love is the starting point. And not only that, you know, it's, it's the awakening of the, uh, of the sort of the, the higher level, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, is really important to all of us, you know. And, I, and that's what I realized that that was the epiphany to actually find that, that that's what I needed to do. I needed to stop. And that's what helped me sort of start having the confidence to create all these paintings and then to write classical music for orchestra. So, yeah. Wonderful. Right? Yeah. And uh, I'm guessing you also had the confidence to write about it too. So this, um, the yeah. new book is uh, shine on the story and this is what we're talking about here today. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, that was the next stage. Um, it was funny because the, uh, those mediums that I used to go to, I joined the spiritual church. They'd have a medium sort of do what we call the platform over here at the end of each service. And they were picking me out nearly every week. But I think it's because, as I say, I was still very connected to the other side. And so they were kind of like getting the energy. And um, quite a few of them were turning around saying, well, they knew nothing about me. They were saying, but gentlemen over there, they're telling me you need to start writing down your story. You need to write, you know, and I was going, yeah, but I'm dyslexic. There's no way I'm going to be able to write this down. I wish, you know, so I, I figured that the only way to do it was through my music and my arts. And um, then a friend of mine, um, 
came into back into my my life again um, a few years back and uh, we got chatting and i just said i you know i'd always wanted to write the story in a, in a book form and he said well you know i can help you out there because you're dyslexic so basically that's how that came about and so the book was the next stage of the game so so just like the the music and and that it was all channeled but not only that that you know a publisher actually came across the manuscript um, through someone else that had sent it to and uh and then he contacted me and said i, I love this this is brilliant I'd, I'd love to can i take it to my you know publishers the rest of the team i think it would be perfect for us and i was going well yeah great you know and i went straight along with that because the energy just felt right you know yeah and it's all just kind of like that energy just energy has just continued and so this is like the next stage for me to be able to get my message out there is through the book coming out and from through me actually talking to people like yourself you know and just getting out, out there and chatting about it as much as people are learning th about it through the music and the art that's so. beautiful thank you and uh we're running out of time but um i just want to remind everybody the name of the book is uh, shine on the story it'll be out on june 26 2020 and David, um, I like to ask this question, especially for those of us who have had these spiritual epiphanies. If you felt that uh, the entire world was watching and listening to every word you're saying right now, what would be the one message you would want the whole world to hear? Uh, well, <laughs> stop, basically. We've, we've all been given a, a golden opportunity right now to actually stop and do exactly what I was talking about that yeah. before and that is to get in touch with your your inner self you know and to start loving yourself you know so, sounds good sounds yeah. good is there anything uh, on the horizon for you after the book are you going to be um doing some more shows or, or yeah well i'm, I'm yeah because I've, I've i've written quite a few new pieces you know since and they've all been premier each one so far has been well i've been very lucky they've, they've been sell out concerts so i it's given me confidence to keep going so i'm i'm working on a new piece at the moment yeah for orchestra which is called uh, i wasn't expecting this so that's that's the next one to come so yeah great title well, <laughs> thank you <laughs> well david thank you so much for joining us today and i really uh, truly appreciate you sharing your time and your story with us it means a lot to to me and i'm sure to everybody that's been watching and we'll keep an eye out for your book coming out thank you yeah okay thanks cheers man and to um everybody before we go ever so quickly i just want to remind everybody that um the class knowing the toro has been moved online and it'll be on um april where did i put it april 11th yes april 11th sorry about that saturday from 1 to 4 30. if you go to the top scroll at the top top of my facebook page you can get a discount code and we'll be spending the whole afternoon together that day and uh as well you can catch me on the kingdom of nye with heather wade on april 16th and remember to check out uh, David's book. Uh, you can go to shineonthestory.com uh, and get more information on that. And David's also on Facebook at David Ditchfield, N-D-E is his handle. And uh, again, thank you very much, David. And thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful week. Bye-bye.